Thanks very much, David, for the kind introduction and obviously for Sharon for, and the other organisers for the opportunity. Um, I'll continue the theme of uh, tacky speaking and also the theme that was set up by Sean in terms of not just thinking about the patient, the valve and the heart muscle, uh, I guess, at the organ level, but actually trying to understand how individuals' cellular responses to the, the challenge that they've got actually influences outcome and how can we get better at incorporating that into clinical algorithms. Because I've got such a short window, I'm just going to use aortic stenosis as the case study. And we all know uh, in our own individual practices that some people can have unbelievably tight stenosis but have actually fairly little myocardial response and actually have a pretty preserved um, function and, and response. And we know in our hearts that this is actually, you know, a predictor of different response to someone that has not had that. Graham Steele, um, back in 1906, published this article observing a similar process, in this particular case thinking about hypertrophy and the fact that obviously to some degree this is adaptive, but our outcome is determined by uh, the maladaptive components of it. So this is taking you back to a cellular level. Cardiac, cardiac fibroblasts um, actually come from a number of different sources, um, both the endocardium and the epicardium. Um, and with both biochemical overload, um, as well as uh, obviously the neurohormonal abnormalities that we see in our patients, we activate these cardiac fibroblasts. And they not only obviously generate collagen 1, collagen 2, both in the interstitium, focally and around the actual vessels themselves, but they also have crosstalk with the cardiac myocyte that actually influences the outcome. And different individuals are very different in the way they actually activate this. I'm definitely not going to go too deep into any of this, so don't stress. But what is different in some of these pathways probably is actually contributed to clinical outcome. So I think I probably feel a little bit like this on a Saturday. Why is this important? One, I've already mentioned, we think it actually relates very closely in a causal fashion to clinical outcome. Two, we actually can actually potentially use this for biomarkers for clinical decision. And that some of this might be advanced imaging biomarkers, and some of it might actually be some novel biomarkers we can work with with some of our clever colleagues. If we can understand the mechanism, it may actually also provide for a therapeutic target that actually might modify in those people that are susceptible to the kind of poor LV response and actually be able to help them, type of, I guess, resist for a bit longer before they uh, deteriorate. So how can we measure myocardial response? Obviously, we've got our classic imaging tools that we use every day, ECG, uh, clinical judgment, echo. I think um, there's opportunity for improved biomarkers. We really don't have very many in the, in the, from the blood perspective at the moment. Obviously, we do use BNP and troponin. Cardiac MR is increasingly tell us, telling us what's actually happening, not quite at the cellular level, but uh, certainly uh, in the interstitium a little bit more. Um, Obviously, we need to index and to consider the individual as a whole. We have to t consider the limitations of the test for the individual. And I think, particularly in valvular disease, we're obviously used to using serial studies. These are some beautiful pictures from uh, some colleagues of mine uh, in London in James Moon's lab. This is Tom Tribal, who uh, did his PhD and then postdoc period with James. And you can see the variety of different um, patterns of fibrosis seen in people with severe aortic stenosis here. And in some people, we get a much more pattern that probably suggests some other pathology here, including coronary disease. But otherwise, in some people, it looks like they, they don't have any focal uh, fibrosis. And in others, they've got quite extensive um, involvement. They went on... In fact, this is actually a Brazilian study that was happening uh, in about 150 patients where they demonstrate... Sorry, 54 patients where they demonstrated a very close relationship between um, the late gadolinium enhancement and the um, fibrosis as detected histologically. And importantly, this Jack paper was one of the first ones to really demonstrate that the fibrosis, whether you measured it by uh, MR or by histology, which was taken at biopsy, was a predictor of all-cause mortality. Should we be incorporating this in decision-making? We all know that aortic valve replacement improves survival when we get to a certain point. But what is difficult to take into consideration at the moment is obviously what's happening at this tissue level. And I think importantly what we see here is, um, as demonstrated by the same Brazilian group, if you've only got mild fibrosis, in this case as measured by both histology or MRI, you have a much better prognosis post-valve replacement than if in fact you already had extensive 
fibrosis. And obviously this is not purely this is a, a causal relationship, but it does suggest that if we uh, can identify people that are susceptible to this earlier, it might change our uh, decision making in terms of when we operate on them. This is just some more data demonstrating that the late gadolinium enhancement, which reflects focal fibrosis in the myocardium, is really strongly associated with mortality um, eightfold in this particular case, and also um, recovery of ventricle post, uh, post surgery. So what are the additional benefits of imaging fibrosis? Obviously this actually touches on the previous talk, um, but what we see here is that using T1 mapping, we actually see the elevated native T1 score that is very classic of amyloid. And in fact, in, um, in Tom and James's study, in fact this is unpublished data, but they certainly have presented it at a number of places, they have demonstrated 6% of their surgical ABRs actually having amyloid. And obviously that is something to take into consideration in these patients. Um, so a number of different MRI techniques, which I won't go extensively into. Uh, we've seen Greg mention the fact that we actually can now attempt to measure, um, and it seems like it's valid, validated now in, right across the world, extracellular uh, volume measurements. Um, at, but importantly, uh, the, the late gadolinium enhancement measurements really only tell us about focal fibrosis rather than actually interstitial fibrosis. So the Brazilian study was looking at um, focal fibrosis with LGE. Uh, this is now from James Moon's lab where they demonstrated that the ECV as measured by the, T the T1 mapping techniques um, was able to again closely correlate not only with the histology but importantly also with functional measures in these individuals. Um, and so in this case it was a six, six minute walk um, here as well as New York Heart Association class. So individual resilience versus susceptibility. This is actually an amazing model. I mean, we're basically sitting here going, what is mediating the individual differences for this? And this is what I guess excites me when you start thinking at a cellular level. And we've been working uh, now with our colleagues across Sydney Health Partners, which now sort of actually spans a population of patients of almost three million patients between uh, all the Sydney University related hospitals. Um, and we initially were focusing on coronary artery disease, but we've recently been in increasing our focus on aortic stenosis as a real opportunity for, for discovery of new biomarkers. Um, some of our group have got um, enormous skills in the omics side of things. We also have uh, a talent in actually being able to grow iPSC-derived uh, myocytes in, in co-culture with fibroblasts, and I'll show you some of that data. This is uh, Kamini Gentile, a, a really talented Italian postdoc in our lab, and he can grow these little mini hearts using um, iPSC-derived uh, cardiac myocytes with endothelial cells and cardiac fibroblasts. And what we're hoping to do here is actually to mimic what's actually happening in the individual patient and see if we can actually break down why, firstly, whether we can actually mimic the differential response to certain stimuli in terms of fibrotic response, but also what's mediating that. So you can see these... Um, this is actually just the cardiac myocytes alone, which are beating kind of out of control. But here what we've actually got is a much more coordinated um, uh, contraction of the, of the co-cultured cardiac spheroid. From a fibrosis perspective, we're actually able to, uh, to stimulate these cardiac spheroids uh, with traditional stimulators of cardiac fibrosis and see a lot more information than what we get out of a classic monoculture. And so what we see here is actually uh, some published data of ours just using uh, doxycycline, where we see an increase in fibrosis compared to the control group that just received vehicle control. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is just a proof of principle rather than looking at individual responses, but in response to TGF-beta, we can actually see this increase in the picoceres red in this patient-derived mini-heart. Uh, so Carmen has actually got some nice relationships going with, uh, with Roche and a number of others in really trying to figure out using this as a, as a model of toxicity. Um, but also I think it's really interesting to think about taking it back to extreme cohorts. For instance, aortic stenosis patients that have huge amount of left ventricular hypertrophy and fibrosis versus those that seem really resilient to it. What can we understand at the cellular level in those individuals? So this is where I love working with clever people. Um, we basically, I'm originally a fairly candidate approach person thinking about inflammation and oxidative signaling as David mentioned, but um, I think the omics uh, explosion has occurred and luckily it's happening around here quite a lot. 
New South Wales Pathology have been helping us uh, in supporting the blood collection from these individuals and storage. Um, but uh, really, it's what we can do with the, our colleagues that help us out with genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, immunomics, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, we've got collaborators over at the Kinghorn uh, Centre for Clinical Genomics and Genome One is the centre that actually helps us there. And I haven't actually got a picture of Andrew Stone, but he's been very helpful. We've got all these um, guys that know about proteonomics. This is John O'Sullivan from HRI and, and Sydney Uni as well, who's a fa fantastic um, clinician researcher who uh, does some work that I can only just begin to, uh, to understand. My role is actually to try to actually provide I guess an opportunity to bring all of this together and actually work with our clever bioinformaticians and mathematicians to apply, um, I guess, state-of-the-art uh, computational biology to understand back at the original clinical question, what is actually different in these individuals? Um, so I think given the time, I won't actually spend too much time to, except to say, you know, hopefully I've opened your mind to the fact that the timing is right. Previously, obviously, this is looks like a fishing expedition, but in fact, with clever bioinformatics and the, the explosion of technology within the omics, we might be able to take these individuals who've actually got these extreme responses to the classic clinical uh, load that we see and hopefully end up with some novel discovery. So just to get to the summary conclusion, considering the individual's myocardial response is important for the clinical outcome of that individual. Differences in this myocardial response we know from an imaging perspective do matter to the outcome and certainly improvements in imaging will help us uh, hopefully develop better algorithms that can get our timing right with uh, intervention. Better algorithms to improve uh, timing may also include blood biomarkers as we get better at this, but hopefully uh, with the assistance of some of our clever colleagues we may be able to identify also novel therapeutic targets. There is really a deficiency as I said for therapies that actually alter this myocardial response in individuals with pressure load from aortic stenosis. And I think that understanding this better at a molecular level may actually help us in the future uh, discover ways to improve that for those individuals. These are some of our friends around the place that have been helping out with a lot of the work. Sharon's actually really um, been a, a big ball of energy that's arrived at the calling recently and has been helping us out with everything from mouse echo to, um, to some of our studies. I didn't actually touch on uh, particularly the cardio-oncology one that we're doing with Peter as well. Um, but obviously Sydney Health Partners has a, a great opportunity here to use the depths of, uh, of kind of basic science skills to apply their skills to a clinical question that hopefully is relevant to, to uh, improving patient outcome. Uh, and that's just some of the gang from, from the colleagues. So thanks very much. Thank